So do you see my screen? Thumbs up if you can. Okay, cool. So data room in a day, and I call it geoscience leadership. Aha. So I'm going to focus a lot on geoscience because often as the leader of uh, uh, a data room, it's a geoscientist who leads it quite often because you'll see that that's always at the top of the tornado chart, always at the top of the sensitivity ends up being a bit of the science, uh, the geoscience end of things. So at Aleka, we try to simplify things so that all the disciplines can uh, communicate and relate and do things quickly. So first question of the day, I've done this for a lot of my friends in every country I've presented in. I'm going to ask you and you can put it in the chat. How much of uh, Indonesia's energy comes from fossil fuels as a percentage of your domestic consumption? Any guesses? You're welcome to put something in the chat. I'll watch the chat here. Anybody willing to guess? What's the percentage? Yeah. Oh, 95, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Anybody else making a guess? Yeah. Um, it's in the chat box on the bottom right. If you're willing, if you're not willing to take a guess, I got 90 from there you go, Mr. Zamuri. Thank you very much. 90, not bad. 70 from Mr. Kurniawan. Thank you very much, Angoro. Uh, that's very nice of you. So we got a big wide range. Okay, I'm going to keep going. So if you guessed 93, you'd be correct. That was based on 2020's consumption. So clearly energy is very important. 85 from NDEC, thank you NDEC. It's, at, it's 93 based on consumption. And a little bonus question, uh, is Indonesia a net importer or exporter of oil, crude oil? You guys probably all know that. Um, you guys are a net importer. Okay, so sustainable energy investments are very important. Uh, I see that uh, Paolo spent a lot of time doing data rooms, uh, building uh, evaluations in the past 10 years. That's a lot of work. And at Aleka, we recognize that guiding sustainable investment decisions are very important. And often they're led by subsurface people, okay? So it doesn't matter if you're in conventional energy projects or alternative energy projects subsurface plays a key role. And I think subsurface leadership is key, okay? Um, obviously we build uh, as, a, as a team, multidisciplinary team, you'll build an opportunity funnel, okay? You'll look at many things, but ultimately you wanna evaluate and high grade quickly. As Paulus mentioned, maybe you only have a day or two. That's where Aleka comes at its strength because if you're just looking at exploration, you have this maturation process where you need to look at all the elements and make a recommendation, don't you? To drill a prospect or not, or to high grade a, a, a series of prospects and how to uh, invest in those. At Aleka, we have a technical and commercial toolkit and we're gonna allow you to look at things quickly and rank things in a standardized way and so that you can be very proactive in your opportunity list and not reactive. It's always nice when an, an asset comes for sale and your team has already evaluated it, maybe six months ago, maybe a year ago. But if you evaluate a lot of things that are out there, you can be proactive and maybe pursue the things you want rather than reactive on what, on what gets uh, released. So it's a very important uh, position to be in as a company. So Aleka has built a series of tools and I'm gonna go through a few. Some of them are around project management. Some of the important ones that we've, we've built out are like the hydrocarbons in place calculators that are probabilistic and there's a roll up and there's a tornado. That's probably our biggest suite of tools that we try to duplicate a lot of the software that's out there. We're on the cloud, we're a bit more collaborative and we connect it. We connect it to the project management aspect also to the production forecast aspect, to the economics, and over to even the sustainability and the carbon footprint. I'm not gonna go through a lot of these today. I'm gonna focus a little bit on the hydrocarbons in place one, because there are a lot of geoscientists that are coming in today. But clearly, um, 
The hydrocarbons in place calculator is, is very important. Here's some of the statistics we can do. I'm gonna go through some of them now. But when we talk about P sub G, we, we have a standardized way to do it in Aleka. We, I don't wanna go into too much detail. We can certainly debate it later. But if you look at it, what's the learnings in industry? You need to be very clear on your standards and you need to basically simplify it so that all the way across your entire portfolio, you've, you've approached it the same way each time. So it's, those standards are very important and simplifying things is very important. If it's super complicated, I find you can't convince anyone to give you money to drill it. So it's a, it becomes a moot point at that, at that stage. So in Aleka, you'll see a common theme of minimum, most likely maximum. And it's everywhere from geosciences. Geoscientists are very good at this, by the way. Engineers, economists, they all need to put a minimum, a most likely, and a maximum. And you need to understand how each element kind of relates to each other. And, and also, you need to understand statistics. So I'm going to give you a quick rundown on how Aleka does it. And it's very similar to other software packages out there, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Triangle similar to Aleka's triangle, um, you see that your minimum and maximum defines the ends and the most likely defines the mode. If you look at normal, you're going to define the most likely and then a standard deviation, aren't you? And then your minimum and most likely will be cutoffs at that point. Okay, so then what is your, your distribution at that point? I don't know what it looks like, but I know normal distributions go to infinity but in this case, we're going to be cutting it off. Log normal, probably one of the most challenging ones to describe because now you're into the natural log of the most likely term. Once again, it is a challenge to, to set this up quite often. And you need to be an experienced person to use log normal. I personally like triangle and normal. That way I can communicate it. I can communicate it to the other disciplines and, and so that they understand what we're doing. The other one is uniform. Often we don't know exactly what the distribution should be. So we can use uniform. It, 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 it's something you can test on Aleka and, and we do do that quite often. The other one is Swanson's. You'll see a lot of paper on Swanson's mean or Swanson's uh, statistics, which is 30, 40, 30. And uh, it's a great way when things are discrete and you don't know how to weigh them, just use Swanson's. And then you're putting 30% on the low side, 40% of the outcomes will be along the most likely, and 30% will be on the upside. It's called Swanson's. There's lots of papers on it. Uh, Aleka has that opportunity for you to use those discrete numbers as well. Okay. Uh, ultimately, you want to know the sensitivities. In this case, uh, Aleka can show you the sensitivities. Here's our tornado chart once you run it through on the hydrocarbons in place and you can see what the dominant factors are. The dark purple in this case is the 80 percentile um, confidence level, right? The P90 to P10. The most likely number is centered in the middle. Here we've got 8.45 million barrels uh, in our little prospect here. And uh, the P90 sits here and the P10 sits up here. And then these, these outcomes here are out to the edge of, of the simulation. But if you were to go to the full simulation, of course you have uh, other outcomes which are completely out of the range. And, and that's if uh, you look at the simulation in general, but there's so few outcomes out here, you shouldn't concentrate on that. You should really be looking at it um, like a proper tornado. You only vary one of the outcomes at a time. And here's a proper tornado, okay? We can go through that with you. If you wanna book a demo with us, we can show you that. But all of you are quite familiar with sensitivities that are, you know, thickness and area, what is that? That's your GRV, right? Uh, you add porosity, that's your uh, pore volume. Um, and then uh, your net, your net uh, reservoir rock would be the thickness area and net to gross. And then moment you include your hydrocarbon saturation, what is that? That is your pore volume, your net pore volume for hydrocarbon. And then the one over BO, in this case, 
you would multiply by that to get your reservoir conditions to surface, okay? So I'm sure you're all familiar with the hydrocarbons in place equation. If you're not, give us a call and we'll uh, book you a demo. Why am I showing you that? Ultimately, when you want to, at the end of your evaluation, you will be presenting to um, management and asking for money quite often. What's at the top of the tornado chart for economics? Almost every time, and I've been working in the industry almost 30 years, almost every time it's your subsurface uncertainty that drives that, that top of the tornado chart for economics right it's your production your production rate which is tied we know it's tied to the in place number so as a geoscientist you are the number one reason why economists stay up at night because you give the top of the tornado chart almost all the time okay so it's a very important thing to understand your ranges and it's a very important thing to communicate them um i've worked in companies where i I just shake my head. Sometimes everyone falls in love with one number and they run it through with one number when they forget that every single number has a range. And uh, we like to carry those through at Aleka and communicate those at all times so that people don't lose track of the risk or the uncertainty in everything we do. So, um, Please uh, let us know if you're interested in working with us on, on things like this. But uh, certainly as a geoscientist, you help lead the important aspects of evaluating, of doing a data room in a day. You're critical. And um, we recognize that for a long time here at Aleka. Uh, so data room in a day, that was just a preamble. I'm gonna now go through how you can quickly evaluate something in our software. And, and I'm gonna walk through a situation here that is uh, a data room. Maybe you're invited tomorrow to a data room. This is act an actual data set somewhere in the world. The National Oil Company is marketing a field and they're looking for someone to come in and commit to drill a well. You see this all the time. Here's a map, here's one well, you have a sand. Okay, it's a clean sand. You know, it's a coarsening upward sequence, okay? And a nice map. And the field actually produced some oil and they had rented a, an FPSO and they produced some oil. They produced one and a half million barrels already from this well, okay? And it's an FPSO where the gas is flared. All right, so another, another aspect of Aleka is that we do calculate the carbon footprint of your project at least the first high level footprint where you can see um, at least a screening type of footprint. That way you understand where your carbon footprint is. The next thing is based on some expert, some uh, competent expert report, you they say that there's 2.3 million barrels of reserves. There's a second zone that maybe has 3 million barrels of uh, contingent resource resources to rent an, o, an FPSO is 25 million and well cost 10 million decommissioning is 10 million. Okay. And then there's an alternative. There's an alternative to an FPSO where you could put a pipeline in for 25 million. Okay. So I want you to build a picture. Actually, most, uh, most people in our industry are pretty good at building a picture. Do you have a picture now? You have a production. It used to be pretty good. 4,600 barrels a day, it was a great well. Now it's doing 2,180 barrels of oil per day after about a year, okay? Produced one and a half million barrels and there's a competent person's report or an expert report, which we're gonna go through now. And what's the first thing? Typically, what is the first thing you do when you hit a data room? You want to calculate hydrocarbons in place. You wanna make sure that you know, whatever the map was, whatever the sand thickness was, whatever the oil property was, you want to calculate the hydrocarbons in place. And that's where a lot of us come in. That's where we start. So the expert report is there and let's verify it. Let's double check their numbers. Okay, let's take a look at the well log, take a look at the map, go through and calculate it together. So you search and you find the expert report 
And in Aleka, you can quickly rebuild um, the probabilistic assessment with the range of porosity, hydrocarbon saturation, net to gross, the BO factor, um, your shrinkage factor in this case, the area thickness, which is your gross rock volume. And then you're gonna have a, a gas oil ratio typically from, from the well. Of course, they're flaring the gas in this case. We're gonna talk about that. Then you're gonna have a result. And these are your end members, aren't they? They're the minimum, absolute minimum and the absolute maximum. When you run the simulation, when you run it 100,000 times, in this case, we pick triangle for everything. To keep it simple, you can mentally see a triangle, can't you? Around the minimum, most likely, and maximum. If you run this, you end up with a probabilistic oil in place of 6.8, 8.7 to 11.3 thereabouts, okay? So how does that compare to the uh, expert report? It actually was very reasonable in this case, okay? It was very close to what they came up with. So our software is different. Maybe they use normal distributions. Maybe they use log normal. Maybe they'd use discrete. Maybe they used uniform. But based on triangular, we were able to duplicate within a few minutes. Literally within a few minutes, we were able to duplicate their numbers. Now it won't be exact, but in our opinion, we, we can check the box. We checked the thickness of the sand. We checked the parameters. We checked the areas, all these things. So I guess we get a green, a green light from a hydrocarbons in place. Things go, things go bad after this, but usually this is pretty good because you can't, you can't deviate too much on these parameters. Okay. The next thing, Maybe what, what would be the next thing you look at? So the next thing we look at is the production forecast. Now the expert report typically has a production forecast. So you take a look at it and how did they build it? What did they do? And it's usually some type of forecast based on decline curve analysis, okay? And here are their parameters. I can show you their parameters here. If you're on a phone, okay? So do you remember the 2180 barrels per day? That was the last production rate uh, based on that production graph. And then they put in a 0.2 and a 0.3 and a 0.4 DI, okay? So the annual decline rate. And Aleka has a few more parameters you can put in, but there's no plateau in this case. And then there's an abandonment rate and a B factor for um, uh, uh, hyperbolic, decline, okay? So this is a hyperbolic decline from point, point zero 0.01 to point 0.4 to point 0.99, all right? So point zero 0.01 is nearly exponential, point 0.99 is basically harmonic, isn't it? Okay, so this is the way it looks. This is the three production profiles. So once again, within a few minutes, you can recreate the expert report. And what we do is we run a probabilistic forecast and we can do uh, a P90, a P50, a P10. And you can see here, we ended up with 1.9, 2.1, and 2.3. If you look back on the other slide, I showed you um, the National Oil Company that was marketing the property said what? They said that there was 2.3 million barrels in the forecast. So now you know the 2.3 is what? It's on the high side. It's on the high side, which is okay. I mean, I would do, uh, I would do on the high side as well, wouldn't I? Okay, but odds are you need to, to quote the 2.1 or the 1.9, depending on your company's policies. Okay, so because you were able to recreate them, it gets a green, gets a green flag as well. Okay, so you're able to recreate the expert report you're able to know where the 2.3 million barrels of forecast comes from, but there's something bothering you. And what should be bothering you is this annual decline here of 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and 0.4. Now, if you remember what the well did originally, I'll, I'll put it back on screen. If you remember, it was producing 4,691 barrels of oil per day. And then after about a year, it had dropped to 2180. 
So what kind of decline is that? Is that 20, 30, 40%? No, it's about 60%. So how the expert report, how did the experts that are helping the national oil company market this property, how did they come up with this 20, 30, 40 uh, decline when the existing production shows more like 60? So we can't solve that in a day, unfortunately. You have to dig in deeper, but clearly that's a red flag. It's a red flag and now you know, now you know where to focus, right, as a team. I think Paulus mentioned it. You only have a few days quite often in a data room. So now you need to dig in and try to unravel, play detective as to why there's a 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and 0 0.4 on the DI versus uh, the data, which is saying like it should be 0 0.6. Okay, so it's a red flag. Nice to know, isn't it? So now you can focus for the rest of the days that maybe you have access to the data. Maybe you wanna jump in and, and look at their, their uh, simulation runs if they have dynamic simulation, or maybe you wanna just do some more uh, analog data analysis, but this is clearly a red flag. The next one, recovery factor. So now you've got hydrocarbons in place and you've got a production forecast you can calculate a range in your recovery factor now, okay? So once you've combined your forecast with your existing production, in Aleka, we'll let you calculate quickly a matrix of hydrocarbons in place, which you calculated. You calculated your hydrocarbons in place, if you remember 6.8, 8.8, and 11.3, and you can see your production profile here at the top from P90, P50 uh, to P10, which is the 2.3, which you've calculated and duplicated your expert report. Now let's look at recovery factors. And if you look at the recovery factor from the small production profile, maybe with the smallest um, hydrocarbons in place, you're looking at 50%. So the right away you should say you know that doesn't look right that's a little high because for one well on a small field under natural depletion 50 percent recovery doesn't make sense it's a little bit high isn't it i think at the beginning we asked everyone what the typical recovery factor is and a typical recovery factor under natural depletion is anywhere 25 30 percent somewhere around there for a typical oil field in indonesia or in Malaysia as well. So you can see here on the high side, uh, if, you if you have your highest oil in place of 11.3, then it comes down to 34. But uh, the P50 to P50 is around 41% recovery factor, which is it's a little bit high, okay? Now again, you can't solve this here, but what you can do is understand that this range of 34 to 56% recovery factor is a red flag. It is a red flag, something's a disconnect. So what's the disconnect? Most likely the forecasted production is too optimistic, okay? So that's what came out of this data room. If you look at it in a day, going through all the reports, rebuilding it in Aleka, combining your hydrocarbons in place, combining it with the forecasts and the existing production, you end up with these red flags, okay? And you can do it quickly. Uh, it, it guides you into working deeper in, into something else, which is what you need to know. You need to know where to focus during a data room. So what happened here? You remember that they also gave you some numbers for costs. I'm not gonna go into the cost too much. We're just gonna use them at face value. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep the range of uncertainty in the production, in the production profile, okay? So I'm gonna show you some plots on cash flow now. And what is cash flow? It's cash out uh, minus cash in, okay? So your cash in is your revenue and your cash out is your capital expenditures your operating expenditures and your decommissioning or your abandonment expenditures. 
which we call CAPEX, OPEX, and ABEX, or decommissioning. Okay, so I'm going to combine all these costs with the production profile forecast for the next five years. And we're going to try to do a, a real quick analysis on what value this, this property can bring to your organization. And, and we do it in one day. Remember, we're, we're doing things in one day. So this is the base case of do nothing where you rent the FPSO, you put the field back on production, and you have those three production profiles. So the first year, you make a little bit of money. The second year, you make a little bit of money. But the third year, your low case and your mid case are nearly underwater. So all these other years, you probably wouldn't want to be producing because odds are you're going to be underwater. Your cash out is going to be more than your cash in. Okay? So what does this case show you? Clearly, it's dominated by this FPSO rental, 25 million per year, and your range of uncertainty in the production. Yeah? Because in this case, I kept the oil price flat, and uh, the oil price was the client's oil price that was flat, and I, I won't touch that. I won't get into oil price. If you have any kind of visionary things on what's going to happen with oil price, I don't. Uh, but I kept it flat. And, and this variability in the cash in is really just your forecast, okay? So the production forecast, which is really linked to your hydrocarbons in place, okay? So this is a red flag that if you were to acquire this asset, and not drill the well, um, and just take it over, you'd have to pay 25 million a year for your FPSO and odds are after two years, it's gonna sink underwater. So the next one was try to conserve the gas. So there was an opportunity where you invest in a pipeline, you have a much lower OPEX. Uh, so here you've got CAPEX and then here's your OPEX. And in this case, you actually extend the life because your OPEX is lower, okay? So you've extended the life by another two years. So by the time you hit the fourth year, you, you, you're still making money. The fifth year, you're underwater, probably on the mid case. Okay, so again, the biggest sensitivity, hydrocarbons in place connected to your production profile. Okay, in this case, uh, the pipeline reduces your greenhouse gas emissions. Fantastic, you're no longer flaring. You're able to get uh, all of your oil and your natural gas to market, okay? So that's a good news. So this is a green flag. If you were to take over the property, you would put in a pipeline most likely. So, but what did the host government want you to do in this case? The host government wanted you to drill a well, okay? Um, it's still a little bit uh, marginal here on this case because your downside case is negative always. So that's a bit of a red flag as well. Okay, so you're, depending on how much risk you want to take as a company, this would be a concern. But remember, the host government wanted you to drill a well. So let's drill the well. In this case, you would drill a well and put in a pipeline. Okay, so conserve the gas, which is putting in a pipeline, and drilling a well. And in this case, that makes a lot of money. Okay, so now within, again, within a day of breaking apart the expert report, breaking apart all the profiles provided to you by the company, you can frame the project and you know where to concentrate. You know the red flags you can concentrate on. So this one is very valuable. So now you need to really think about that second zone, and I'm not getting into the second zone here, but that second zone is clearly very important, okay? And this is a green, this is green. You, you, you need to pursue this, okay? So the host government wants you to drill a well. This would make sense. So conserving the gas is, is part of uh, Aleka's mantra. How do we relook at all these old fields, all these aging assets, all these near field opportunities, all these exploration ideas? How do you bring 
some type of sustainability, you know, rather than flaring, can you do something? Can you put in pipelines? Can you conserve the gas? Um, coming from Canada, we even have uh, some companies that are building containers that are full of Bitcoin machines where they use the gas instead of flaring it, they run it through an electrical generator and the electricity they generate right on site uh, runs a bunch of Bitcoin mining. So it's doing anything you can uh, to generate revenue, but also conserve the gas or use the gas, use the energy. At Aleka, we're pretty keen on making sure that young professionals understand this. Once again, get in touch. We'll do a demo. We can show you how many tons of CO2 you could save on your next project. Okay, so consider building a risk register. I know a lot of subsurface teams don't build risk registers. It's kind of very, very common for facilities teams or drilling teams to drill to build risk registers. I'm asking now, as geoscientists and as engineers on the subsurface, start building risk registers. You'll learn a lot. In this case, after one day's work looking at all the data on uh, a data room, you could build a risk register which would be your red flags and your green flags. But the red flags, do you remember what your red flags were? Well, the annual decline in the recovery factor were red flags, weren't they? So what would you do when you build a risk register? Register You talk about severity and likelihood, and then you talk about mitigation plans. What are your plans to mitigate this? What more work would you have to do to reduce the uncertainty in this, okay? That's mitigation. So it's great to build risk registers. I'm a big fan of those. What was the next one? The FPSO at 25 million a year. Can you get that down? Is there a mechanism? And certainly Indonesia is a leader in these kind of things. You guys have a, a lot of shipbuilding capacity and a lot of uh, FPSOs that might be available. So is there a way to get that 25 million down? Next, the pipeline case is still marginal. Could you reduce the cost on, on the pipeline and certainly get that low case, that low case production profile to make money? So uh, the Aleka risk register is available and it's part of our project management tools. I urge all teams to, to go through all the modules quickly. And I, I am a big fan of doing things in a day. Do it quickly. And then you know where to focus your time and, and where that value sits. Okay. Um, how much time do you invest? How much time do you invest in the data room? How much time do you invest in the evaluation process? And maybe all you need to do is raise the red flag you know, and, and to solve it might be three months of study. Do you want to invest? Put it into the, 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 the boss's uh, decision. Should we invest an extra three months or should we just carry the uncertainty? Uh, what is the mitigation? Correct. What is the mitigation? And maybe you need an expert. Maybe you need to hire uh, an expert on geomechanics, on decline analysis. Maybe you need to do dynamic simulation. I don't know but you can talk about it because you've red flagged it. Okay, um, what else? So when you do something in a day and run it through from hydrocarbons in place, you've got your range as a geoscientist, you've connected with the recovery factor to your reservoir engineer and your decline curve analysis, your forecast. Then you've connected it to the economics and you know what makes sense. You've got all your red flags. How do you communicate to the powers that be or uh, the decision-making team within your organization or your client, if you're a consultant? What do you communicate? Well, in the end, you will communicate, obviously, the costs. That's very important. You'll communicate uh, the result, the NPV. And then you'll look at things like uh, how long you know, how, what's the end of life? Is this, is this a long-term project? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? In this case, it's, it's 24 months, 48 months, or, or five years. 
Okay? So after one day of what we call quick look screening and with a toolkit like Aleka, all of you, all of you can now communicate to the leadership team where you sit on the project, your mitigation plans, and what's the, what's the work ahead of you? And should you do it? Because with the, the mitigation plans, you have to make an estimate. Is this going to be a week's worth of work to address this red flag? Or is it a month's worth of work? And what would that cost to do that? So uh, I'm a big fan of working this way. And you can actually put it to the leadership team at that point. After one day, yes, one day, you can put it to the leadership team and say, well, does this fit in the long-term vision of the company? Okay, I think that's it, Paulus. Uh, I talk fast, um, sort of like data room in a day. You, you need to be able to move fast, but um, I'll stop sharing. Uh, what are your thoughts? Okay, so I think we go to the Q&A session. So if everybody can uh, type the questions in the chat box, uh, and then we will read the questions. And sure, let's just sure. answer the, the questions. Sure. I, I guess so, uh, while waiting for the questions to come in, uh, maybe I would like to know uh, how how much uh, is it very customizable uh, this tool? Um, because so, I believe its company will have their own taste on doing things, right? So correct, correct. So how customizable is it right now? We can build modules in about uh, three months. We can research, develop, and certainly with the guidance of companies. We, uh, we can change things within three months. Uh, the customization, we, we try to bring some type of standardization more, but um, certainly if you need a, a custom module, you, you get in touch with us and we'll build it with you. We'll build it with you. And we've already had requests to do that from different clients mm -hmm. where we build them specific modules based on exactly the way their company does things. So it's very specific. Uh, but we, we, we would do it for you, for sure. Okay. And then for the, I think in one of the slides you mentioned about the, how you, when you put the category of the, of the certainty and then it immediately transfer into a number. Uh, is there any explanation behind that? Uh, I mean, for instance, um, when do you want to, uh, to put like most likely, I mean, is there any, any explanation behind that or? So every company, I, and I have another slide on that too. Uh, every company has a different methodology. So th the most important thing you can do is standardize within your organization. So if you go to a data room and you use the Aleka tool, you already have, uh, you've already looked at things throughout your portfolio, right? And I would hope that you have a standardized way, standardized way within your organization. Certainly the big companies do. Uh, so what we do, we try to do is keep it flexible. This is where you can look at it from your company's point of view and what does most likely mean? What does, uh, you know, uh, probable, probable mean, possible? Um, you can assign a number to each of those. So in our Aleka, we can assign a number, you can assign a number, um, and be very flexible within your organization and, and let it, your organization guide you. It's the same as the risk register on severity and uh, probability of, of occurring. Every company has a different way to risk things. So on a risk register. So we leave it very flexible where you can put in your own guide on what each one means. So of course, Aleka, I'm a very opinionated guy and I've worked for many different companies. Mm. And, um, you know, I've helped Petronas on occasion. I've worked ConocoPhillips on occasion, Mubadla, Pearl Energy, uh, Rock Oil. Um, we've consulted for small companies. We've consulted for very big companies. No one does it a standardized way. And yet everyone's very opinionated about it. Um, there was a nice one, uh, Alexei Milk, you know, uh, Alexei put some things out there on, you know, piece of G and all those things. And he had a nice one about uh, 
comparing Exxon and Shell and Total and BP and Petronas, they all have different views on uh, what P sub G means. Oh. Yeah. And uh, I thought it was a curious one. It was a curious post because these are all the big names and they have hundreds of geoscientists. But uh, anyways, any questions? If there's uh, any questions in the chat box? Okay, everyone's pretty quiet. Is everyone interested in uh, understanding Aleka or uh, do you guys understand what we do uh, with this software? It's a cloud-based software and we um, can again get people to uh, collaborate online and certainly um, um, do things quickly. So our, our whole idea is that you do things, uh, it'll run probability, yes. Uh, yeah, we can do uh, probabilistic assessments, both on hydrocarbons in place and on the uh, decline curve analysis. And soon we're gonna run it on the economics as well. So you'll get, you know, every P1 to P100, you know, so every single uh, probability point for hydrocarbons in place, Often we only look at P10, P50, P90, and we also have the P1 to the P100 for the decline curve analysis or the probabilistic forecast. Again, we focus usually on the P10, P50, P90. We now connect that to economics, and right now we're running economics as discrete cases, minimum, most likely maximum. But very soon we're gonna bring our uh, our probabilistic engine with 100,000 runs, we're gonna bring that to economics. So now you'll have a P10, a P50, P90, NPV value. And obviously there's a lot of dials, right? There's a lot of uh, things you can put in, a lot of ranges you can put in once you hit the economics. Okay, thank you for the question. So at Aleka, we try to combine, you know, uh, project management because a lot of times as geoscientists, we tend to work really hard. We'll, we'll, we'll work hard on one aspect of the project, but in reality, we never do get the uncertainty narrowed much. It, it happens, yeah? So if we have a DHI, could Alerica de-risk that in the risk calculator? Okay, so if you have a DHI, obviously, that is, you know, going to de-risk your hydrocarbon, right? Uh, hydrocarbon, you know, uh, um, your reservoir quality most likely. So reservoir quality is going to go through the roof, and so does your uh, hydrocarbon presence, yeah, and seal effectiveness. So yes, you would put in, but there's a lot of ways, and there's a lot of good papers on it as well on DHIs and how it takes. If you don't have a DHI and then you, you bump it up to, uh, with geophysical support on direct hydrocarbon indicators, there's some great papers and we, we, we could put that in to Aleka easily. And certainly if you're working with a, a big company, let's say a Pertamina or a Petronas or a PTTP, they have their standardized way to take a, a typical prospect uh, risking and step it up once you've got geophysical support such as a DHI. So yes, we can build that in. Yes, we have that capability. And yes, we can reference an article. Pick an article or pick an internal uh, qualitative interpretation aspect and we can build that in. It looks like crystal ball. It is very similar to crystal ball. Thank you very much. Uh, it's actually Monte Carlo simulation, right? It's 100,000 runs. Um, it's run on Microsoft Azure, okay? So it's not run on my laptop. Um, so now you can go to a thin and light laptop and be a very cool person, right? Um, so it's run on Microsoft Azure on the cloud. It runs quickly, like um, I didn't open up the software here, but it'll run in, uh, we can do 100,000 runs in about, you know, six, seven seconds. And then when you do some of our probabilistic roll-up tools, I think we had one that had like 30 zones. That would take, uh, would take not a minute, but it would take a while. It would take maybe 30, 40 seconds 
to roll up all of those probabilities. Yeah, 100,000 runs each, okay? And then you would sum up each run. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. It is very similar to Crystal Ball. Um, Crystal Ball is a product from Decision, en Decision Engineering out of Denver. Based on how much does DHI de-risk uh, the piece of G calculation with that increase? Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting one. Would uh, With geophysical support, yes. Uh, I think it's fairly well documented and it's not looking forward, it's looking back. Case studies have shown that you can take something that is, uh, let's say, a, a 30%, you know, uh, P sub G, POS, and then with a DHI, taking it up to 80, yeah, there, there has been cases. Um, unfortunately, there's always the case of fizz gas. If you're familiar with fizz gas, and it's certainly Indonesia has a lot of that. As you know, uh, some of the shallow gas zones, um, you can get five, six percent residual gas saturation and trapped in a lot of uh, a lot of these uh, sands, shallow. But um, if you're down at a reservoir level and you get great um, QI or great quantitative interpretation from your seismic with support. And certainly in North America, when you get down to AVO analysis, um, if you have AVO support as well, you can get up into P, P sub Gs of 80% for sure. Yeah. But this then, next question uh, starts. The data quality and availability affect the scoring of field prospect lead. Does data quality, of course, data quality, but then you get into analogs. Um, you always have poor quality areas, and that's why they're not drilled quite often, isn't it? So you, let's say you got a, a great 3D within a, a field, and then you walk over onto the 2D quite a ways away, you're always going to suffer from data quality, right? Uh, so that's where analogs come in. And your basin analysis, you, you, you'll leverage other things. But uh, you would try to keep it fair. You want to keep it fair. And if it's a data quality issue, um, again, risk registers help. What would be the mitigation to data quality, right? Um, can, you, can you reprocess? Can you go out and shoot a low cost site survey type of 2D and to try to increase the resolution? Can you do some modeling, forward modeling, and see if there should be a DHI? Would your old data, usually seismic, would your old seismic data, should it, should it have seen a DHI? If there's gas, if there's oil, if there's a gas gap, whatever. So there's a lot of forward modeling you can do that even if your data quality is poor, should it have seen a direct hydrocarbon indicator or not? So um, lots you can do. Once again, I go back to risk register and mitigation and analogs. These are all, these are all the weapons in your, in your uh, arsenal, okay? These are all the quiver. They're, uh, they're the arrows in your quiver, okay? If you're, a, if you're an archer, these are the arrows in your quiver. A risk register and... Um, uh, understanding how to mitigate that and an analog, getting an analog and doing some forecasting, doing some modeling, doing some uh, geophysical modeling on should the data have seen it? Should you have seen a DHI even on poor quality data? Okay, any other questions? I see Praga posted uh, the feedback form. Uh, so, so I have a question sir, for you. So. Uh... Lately, when I attended like the a data room, uh, I saw several uh, companies now try to sell like a, a multiple targets, right? And then uh, in some uh, cases, these multiple targets will have a shared uh, risk. So meaning that uh, uh, different uh, targets will have will have like a shared uh, probability of success, right? So how does uh, Alika um, 
uh, attack this issue. I mean, uh, address this issue. Okay, so we would probably look at it. Um, th thanks, Paulus. That's a common and it's a difficult one. I'm sure everyone has an opinion on this. The way I would look at it is there's always a primary zone. There's always a primary, there's always the analog primary zone. And in fact, every discovered field, the whole development needs to be carried by at least one of the zones, typically. Uh, I've worked on many fields that have uh, behind casing opportunities on a lot of the thinner zones. So our idea is that you would break it apart and communicate properly. So that's our position, break it apart. Um, you can roll up the, the volumetric side. That's an easy way to do it. You can roll up the volumetrics, although I don't recommend it. Um, you would have a, a primary zone and secondary zones. Okay. And I would, I would avoid rolling it up. Why? Because ultimately you want to drill the well and run economics. And even these secondary zones, they're, they're called bailout zones quite often. Yeah. So your bailout zones, yeah, um, there's lots of uh, articles on it. Certainly Alexei, Alexei Milkov has uh, quite a few as well. And I, I love the guy. He, he, he really frames it properly. It's, it's so complex to roll these up that often we, we can't communicate it then to the economist and to the development team. How do you communicate that to the development team? And then how do you develop? How do you develop it? So from experience, I split it out into the, from primary zone to uh, secondary zones. And you can roll up the secondary zones on the volumetric side, that's no problem. But on the risking side, really it's gonna be dominated by your, um, by your big zone, by your, your primary zones, okay? Um, so that's the way I would recommend doing it on a Leica, split them up, be very clear on how you communicate them to the rest of the team members. And ultimately, you're gonna run economics and you're gonna have to communicate those economics, get a production profile, get a development scenario and a production profile and you're gonna calculate a minimum economic field size, aren't you? And the minimum economic field size is gonna be linked to the number of wells you're gonna drill, the development scenario, uh, price forecast, which is outside our, our remit here. I'll, I'll leave the price forecast to something else. But ultimately, I would, um, I would not roll them up. And I probably stepped in it, I went too far already. But uh, within Aleka, you, you would be urged to, to drive uh, some independent review of each zone. That's what I would urge you to do. But again, if your company has a specific way that you would like to roll these up, then we can certainly uh, build that module. Again, within, a, within two or three months, we'll build a bespoke tool for you to roll up something that has many zones and for your risking purposes, okay? We can, we can do it, but it would be based on, on who at that point. It would be based on your internal decision on how to do that. Okay. All right, next question is, uh, if uh, Aleka can be used for the exploration risk analysis. Exploration risk analysis. So again, um, it's sometimes government. Okay, so where is that? Which question? That's uh, the one be okay. before that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we can uh, certainly help with that. And uh, our, our system is very simple. We've got a play and a risk analysis and a prospect risk analysis. And we, we keep it very simple. So our, our system is, is, is trying to Basically, what we're, we're heading towards is P sub C. We're trying to get you plugged in as a geoscientist, plugged into uh, the economics. Because P sub G is great, but in reality, the, the powers or the leadership team will want a P sub C. So it starts with uh, the geological risk, which is great. That's the way you, you run your whole portfolio. 
but then you're going to need minimum economic field size and P sub C. So it gets super complicated. So I prefer to stay simple and we, we deal it with almost one zone at a time and uh, connecting it, connecting it to the economics because that's where we need to get to. We spend, we spend a lot of time arguing about things uh, in the geoscience world and, and often we don't get things drilled, but I, I, I'm a big fan of trying to get there. Okay, trying to get to uh, the P sub C world. Okay, so it's best to keep things simple at the beginning. That's our goal. Aleka is a bunch of oversimplified tools that help you do things quickly, project manage quickly, mitigate quickly, uh, understand quickly, and ultimately maybe get a decision quickly as well on whether you want to progress it further. Okay. Uh -huh. Next question. Uh, you see sometimes government agencies open only limited data set. How do Aleka optimize this uh, data room process? Okay. So yeah, a limited data set. Uh, that's where analogs come in. Again, if you build that uh, portfolio funnel, remember the opportunity funnel? If you look at many things and then a government a national oil company opens up on one little field. If you've looked at all the fields around quickly, then even with a limited data set on one field, and it happens all the time, uh, that they only give you some of the data. In that case, you can leverage your analog fields that you've looked at in Aleka already, right? So that's, that's the whole point of uh, getting a consultant team in or building a portfolio okay so by building a portfolio and looking at a lot of things you can be a lot more proactive for those kinds of situations so thank you is it matthew thank you happens all the time matthew doesn't it they release a field or uh, uh, an area they don't give you all the data and yeah, they don't give you all the data so you're up you're left with leveraging analogs and if you had a leka you could look at all the analogs and, and evaluate those and leverage your knowledge of those analogs into the area that has limited data. And at least you know ranges, uncertainty, you've done risk registers on the analog fields. Yeah, nice question, good question. Uh, sorry, and then there's another one here. Uh, is it Atsarina? I have a question, but as an entry level geoscientist practitioner, this talk has definitely given me more insights regarding industry. Thank you. Okay. All right. Cool. That's cool. Thank you very much. You're welcome to get involved with Aleka. Again, as a geoscientist or as a reservoir engineer, it's wonderful to uh, uh, look at things quickly, build your analog data set, and communicate to the leadership teams. Uh, on what the ranges are, what the uncertainties are, and uh, get get from P sub G to P sub C. What is the C? You know, the possibility of, probability of commercial success. That's what we need to focus on. And uh, Okay. Well, Sats, I believe we already passed the allocated oh, time. Yeah, so. So, but that much, uh, I think it's okay. So I think I I need to stop you uh, now. Okay, cool. Uh, I would like you. to thank uh, everybody that already attended this uh, webinar. Um, again, uh, if you would like to uh, know more about uh, other things, for instance, um, let us know. Use the email address that uh, you use for the registration. And also, if you, uh, let's say, want to, I believe if you want to book a, a demo, uh, I think you can use the same uh, email address as well. Yes, please. Uh, yes, and please. then uh, I give it to Banu, I think. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, thank you. I, we have another session. Uh, there'll be a feedback form. If you take a look at the, the talk, uh, though, there's a feedback form. Uh, thank you very much. We have another talk coming up. I, I thank Paulus and I thank... Uh, XGO for setting this up, but and Edo, our friend in Edo as well. Uh, our next talk is on uh, again that sustainability theme. Uh, we're using drones uh, to help farmers uh, reduce their CO2. 
drones as well in the oil industry are very well received. So that's the other part. Uh, thank you for your time.